That is unhinged. I think they just took all my favorite songs and put them on this playlist, honestly. You're telling me all of those are delusional? Lover is delusional? The Great War is the bargaining song. So I don't know if these things are coincidental, but I don't know, she's a mastermind. Hello guys, welcome back to the channel, it's Nina. If you are new here, welcome, I'm so happy to have you, and if you're not new, thanks for coming back. As of today, we are eight days away from Tortured Poets, which is absolutely insane. I feel like it just was announced yesterday, the time has flown by, and very soon we will have an entire new album, 20 brand new Taylor Swift songs, and I am beside myself, I'm so excited. But today, as kind of like a last little chat before the album comes out, there's a few things I wanted to talk to you guys about and just chat about. One of them being the five stages of grief playlists that Taylor Swift has put together. She posted some lyrics yesterday or the day before, and then just kind of like my final predictions for this new album. And also I got sent this very cute crew neck. I am obsessed with it and I don't have a ton of merch yet, obviously, because I feel like Taylor has not come out with any merch for the new album yet. So I'm very happy that I got a little piece of fan-made merch. So I will link that down below if you guys want to get yourselves one, because this is so cute tortured poet and then it also says all's fair in love and poetry the little tagline slogan of the album i also like how it looks like it's a college sweatshirt like i'm a student or something because it goes so well with the aesthetic of tortured poets and like i'm kind of a student of taylor swift anyways so first let's talk about the five stages of grief taylor's version because this was like a theory that we actually had before she posted these playlists there was these graphics of each album variant being a different stage of grief like with the colors and everything and so we had denial being the first cover she came out with the original main cover of the album and then we had the second variant which was the bolter that one was a little bit darker and then we had the albatross which was a darker gray and then finally the black dog which is the darkest of all the variants and so we had denial, anger, bargaining, depression. And I think what drove home this theory was that the last variant, the black dog, is actually a metaphor for depression, which kind of like made sense with the five stages of grief. The only thing was that there was four variants and there's five stages of depression. And so the last one is acceptance. So I don't know if that one's gonna come full circle. There is another variant that is gonna be in Target, but it's going to be the same cover as the original Tortured Poets, the manuscript. And for each variant, she has these file names. I didn't really talk about the deluxe tracks or like the bonus tracks on each of the variants yet and the titles of them, but I'm sure you guys have already seen all the theories about them. The first one, The Bolter, this was a pub in London, I believe, but also people were <laughs> making jokes, but also just kind of alluding to the fact that whenever Taylor was pictured with Joe, they would be bolting to the car so they wouldn't get their picture you're taken so take that for what you want and also this variant file name um, in the deluxe CD like collectible pack there is a patch and a bookmark and they all have like a little symbol and on this one it's a rabbit like a, a jack rabbit I think where is that picture? Oh my gosh, I've been looking for this specific post I saw on either Twitter, Instagram, like one of them where the picture of like the 
patch that's kind of cut off. Someone found the full picture in connection with another anecdote about this bolter meaning like the rabbit or whatever. Anyways, that's kind of like the meaning behind the bolter that we are theorizing about. And then we had the albatross, which there was a lot of other meanings about the albatross as well. It's a bird and that's kind of like the symbol of the albatross, but it's also, according to Google, a continuing problem that makes it difficult or impossible to do or achieve something. Another search says they cause great problems from which you can't escape they prevent you from doing what you want to do so take that as you will and then another theory that came up someone was searching and albatrosses the birds can spend up to six years at sea without touching land how long was that previous relationship so anyways that's the albatross and then lastly we have the black dog which had a very direct symbolism to it but it is interesting that they had like the manuscript which is like the first bonus song and then the other three are like symbolized by different animals which i thought was interesting there is also a pub in london called the black dog so i don't know if these things are coincidental but i don't know she's a mastermind i don't know what it is with taylor naming songs after pubs and bars that she's been to but i'm all here for it okay so let's get into these playlists i have glanced through them but I haven't gone in depth yet. I have listened to all the messages from Taylor. I do not have Apple Music however somebody replicated all of the playlists on Spotify so if you guys want to check those out I will link those playlists down below. But for each playlist there is like a voice note from Taylor so let's listen to it and just get a little gist of it if you haven't heard it yet. Which you could probably just look it up and find it on TikTok or wherever. Hey Apple Music welcome to my I Love You It's Ruining My Life playlist this is a list of songs about getting so caught up in the idea of something that you have a hard time seeing the red flags possibly resulting in moments of denial and maybe a little bit of delusion results may vary <laughs> and then it immediately goes into lavender haze that is unhinged Taylor I just she's like if you had any doubt what this album is about let me just tell you exactly what you think it's about it's what it's about. Also, that sounded so fast and I realized I have my like podcast speed on 1.5 because I can't pay attention if they're talking too slow. <laughs> So anyways, that's why I sounded super fast. And then there's a little description for each playlist here. And this playlist is under the lyric, I love you, it's ruining my life songs, which is like the original lyrics on the back cover of the first cover of the album. So this first playlist is inspired by the lyrics that are on the back or, like, or a quote, but I'm pretty sure this is a lyric in one of the songs. And so Taylor basically put a bunch of songs under this that go with the stage of denial. It's funny that in this description it says Swifties began hunting and assembling pinning clues to digital cork boards eventually landing on the theory that her 11th studio album is sure to explore the five stages of heartbreak. And when Swifties agree upon a theory, Taylor takes an interest so naturally she responded by crafting a series of exclusive playlists choosing songs of her own that fit each stage. So I feel like we saw this common thread happening and Taylor said oh I can work with that and I think it may have not been intentional at first, but then now it is because Taylor is clued into this theory. I feel like this album could be very much a concept album as well as an album that was written about the two past two years of her life. So just something to think about. First up is Denial, as heard and felt in a huge swath of her catalog from Love Drunk Oblivion of Lavender Haze to the Starlit Collision courses that are style and treacherous. So let's take a look at these songs, shall we? So as we said, Lavender Haze was first up on the Denial playlist, which is literally insane because if you guys remember, there was a reel posted during the Midnight's promo of her explaining the meaning behind Lavender Haze. Cut to the clip. If you were in the Lavender Haze, then that meant that you were in that all-encompassing love glow, and I thought that was really beautiful. Theoretically, when you're in the Lavender Haze, you'll do anything to stay there um, and not let people bring you down off of that cloud. Um, like my relationship for six years, we've had to dodge weird rumors, tabloid stuff, and we just ignore it. And so this song is sort of about the act of ignoring that stuff to protect the real stuff. 
and she's talking about her six-year relationship and how they've had to dodge rumors and they've made it out alive and they just don't listen to the things and da 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 and she just wants to stay in love. Very much in denial. Like, it's interesting that Taylor uses the word delusion and denial when describing these songs because I think in the beginning you think Lavender Haze is just like a song about being in love regardless of input from other people, but in actuality Lavender Haze is kind of like an idealized fantasy of what you hope for and wish for and that you hone in on. It's very much like the crystallization of a relationship. You hone in on the good things and then you block out the bad things. And that's where the delusion comes in, I think. <laughs> Just one hit after another. We've got Sweet Nothing, Snow on the Beach, Glitch, like, oh my, just those four Midnight songs alone have sent me. Because Glitch is about kind of like something happening that wasn't necessarily supposed to happen. How the system's breaking down because we're still together and them getting together was a glitch. Again, it was by some happenstance and by all of these stars aligning that they were together. She even names how long they've been together in the song. She says, 200, 2,190 days of our love, which is six years. I think the songs on Midnight's that are allegedly about her relationship to Joe all have this common feeling of we've made it this far, so we must be like, we must be meant for each other. And that is a little delusional in like rationale, I think. We've got Betty, Willow, Cruel Summer. Okay, the, this the stack of lover songs here, like Cruel Summer, Lover, Miss Americana, False God. You're telling me all of those are delusional? Lover is delusional? People were having a fit over Lover being on this playlist because so many people had that song like held on a pedestal. It was people's wedding songs. It was the ultimate true love song. And the fact that she's calling it delusional is it's kind of funny. All's well that ends well to end up with you. <sighs> like you write that lyric and these are literally like mimicking wedding vows and she's calling it delusional we are not ready for this album i feel like a lot of the songs she writes about joe are just like it's you and me the world doesn't exist when we're together and i think the harsh reality is it can't always be like that style wildest dreams treacherous that song is about a tumultuous relationship that you just don't think about the consequences of. Ours? Ours is such a delusional song. Ours and Superman? You know those two songs are about her relationship to John Mayer and how delusional she was rationalizing his behavior in the relationship. Ours being like, it doesn't matter what people say. People throw rocks at things that shine. Like any criticism is just like invalid because I know our relationship. And then lastly is Bejeweled. Ending this playlist with Bejeweled, I think was pretty intentional because I mean, she starts with the Midnight songs and then ends with the Midnight song after she's gone through all the other songs. So Bejeweled was my first red flag of like, listening to the lyrics, you're like, what? What is she actually saying in this song? Because she says, and when I meet the band, they ask, do you have a man? And I say, I don't remember. And everybody was so confused about that line because it's like wait she's saying she doesn't have her, a man or is she saying like what what's what's going on here and i think this song is a transition over to our next playlist which is anger the next stage of grief in the cycle and the lyric that goes along with this one is you don't get to tell me about sad i feel like the stage of anger has a lot of different emotions with it there's like angry sad there's angry bitter there's just a lot of complex emotions in this and in the description it says the second stage is anger and it's fair to say that some of her best and most beloved songs boast an edge you'll find that in abundance here coursing through the likes of vigilante shit bad blood and of course we are never ever getting back together all of those songs have different vibes to them and i think some of the other songs she chose to put on this playlist have very different ranges of anger. Even the lyric, you don't get to tell me about sad is very pointed, direct, accusatory. 
Like, you don't get to tell me about being sad. It's very sassy. Okay, let's listen to the message from Taylor. I'm gonna slow the speed down so it doesn't sound like she's speed talking. <laughs> hey, Apple Music, welcome to my You Don't Get to Tell Me About Sad playlist. These songs all have one thing in common. I wrote them while feeling anger. <laughs> Over the years, I've learned that anger can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. But the healthiest way that it manifests itself in my life is when I can write a song about it, and then oftentimes that helps me get past it. Draw the cat eyes <laughs> sharp enough to kill a man. Right into vigilante shit. I think it's so funny how she decides to start and like order these playlists. Yeah, so from Midnight's we have vigilante shit. High infidelity confused me a little bit because I, that song is very complex in plot and it's like, okay, who's who's cheating on who? Who's supposed to be angry in this situation? And for that one, I think high infidelity has a lot of resentment in the voice of it, in the narrative, because she says, you know, like, do you really want to know where I was? She says, you know, there's many different ways that you can kill the one you love. The slowest way Way is never loving them enough. So she's kind of like talking in third person, but she's also kind of showing like, you didn't love me enough. And that's why I'm feeling resentful. So I definitely think that song has some strong feelings in it. And then obviously would have, could have, should have is that angry crying. That is like very similar to Dear John and which is on this playlist. Dear John and would have, could have, should have both on this playlist have that really sad power ballad with such angry undertones. Like when you're yelling that bridge, it's like emotion. You can feel the frustration and the anger and everything. I regret you all the time. Like, ooh, yeah. And then we have from Folklore, Exile. Obviously that song is like a back and forth between two people. She also wrote that song with Joe, William Bowery. Illicit Affairs, Mad Woman, of course. Definitely belongs on this playlist. Tolerate it. I feel like when you're thinking of Folklore and Evermore, people may think there's no way any of those songs are inspired by their relationship because they were happy at the time. But you never know, I feel like you just really don't know what is going on in relationships because she kept that one so private. So I feel like there's always gonna be a lot we don't know, but maybe we'll uncover some of it with Tortured Poets. Cause Tolerate It is obviously about a relationship where you just feel like you love somebody so much and all you feel like is they're tolerating you, which is like, super depressing and it's interesting that she put this on the anger playlist because I think you can kind of tell in her performance of Tolerate It on the Eras tour she adds way more anger to it than the sadness that I thought it first had when I was just listening to it but she's like hitting stuff off the table she's breaking glass she's like you know very animated um bad blood of course is it over now very accusatory in language and then of course we have got red the ultimate like anger breakup songs. I knew you were trouble. We were never ever getting back together. The last time, the moment I knew. I knew you were trouble and we were never getting back together or more fun and upbeat, but like angry in like a tongue in cheek kind of way. And then we have the last time, the moment I knew, which is like sliding down the bathroom wall crying angry. Babe, and I bet you think about me. Babe is like that, like I caught you red handed type of anger. And then I bet that you think about me is like, again, one of the more tongue in cheek, pointing fun at somebody kind of angry, I'm angry with you type of thing. Better than revenge is just full anger to the max, <laughs> like the whole time. Lastly, we got the fearless songs. Tell me why, you're not sorry, forever and always, Forever and always, we know that's one of the anger songs because on the Fearless tour, she would literally throw a chair off the stage in that song and then Mr. Perfectly Fine. Joe Jonas made her angry as well. And this takes us in to the third playlist, Bargaining, which is the one that's coming for me personally the most. The cover of this is the Albatross album and the lyrics are, 
am I allowed to cry? Just the fact that those lyrics are a question kind of go with the bargaining theme where there's a lot up in the air emotionally. One day could be feeling like, yes, I need to get out of this relationship. And then the next day you're kind of bargaining with yourself. We're like, well, when it's good, it's good. And I know there's red flags, but like we always come out on top. Okay, before I get into it, let's listen to the message from Taylor. Hi, Apple Music. You have found the Am I Allowed to Cry playlist. This playlist takes you through the songs that I've written when I was in the bargaining stage. Times when, you know, you're trying to make deals with yourself or someone that you care about. You're trying to make things better. You're oftentimes feeling really desperate because oftentimes we have a sort of gut intuition that tells us things are not going to go the way that we hope. Which makes us more desperate. Which makes us bargain more. Hope you enjoy the playlist. <laughs> fact that it goes straight into the great war the great war i've been saying this for months is like the song that convinced me that something was off here getting into those lyrics if you guys haven't seen i did a whole video on you're losing me and i kind of did like a lyric breakdown slash a common thread that kind of you know i feel like you're losing me was kind of the hindsight bias type of song where you listen to it and you're like looking back on all the songs before it and being like there was signs we just didn't see them so anyways, I talk a lot more in depth about The Great War and a lot of the songs that are on this playlist So you can go check that out But The Great War is the bargaining song because you're telling yourself like even though we're fighting a war We always come out on top. We always survive even in the chorus of The Great War You can hear her saying like I vowed not to cry anymore if we survive The Great War That's like making a deal with yourself. Okay, I will I will not cry over this again if we make it through this one fight. I vowed not to fight anymore. I vowed I will always be yours. And those are kind of like promises made. Once we get past this hurdle, then it's gonna be forever. The bridge of the Great War, you can see the cracks in the armor. Somewhere in the haze, I got a sense I'd been betrayed in the lavender haze. Okay, let's get into more of these songs. Okay, I think they just took all my favorite songs and put them on this playlist, honestly. This Is Me Trying and Peace are my favorite songs from Folklore. I thought This Is Me Trying would be more so of like a depression song, but you can kind of see how she's making deals with herself in the song and kind of being like, pouring out my heart to a stranger, but I didn't pour the whiskey. So it's like finding these different ways of coping. And then Peace is like so interesting because again, she's asking a recurring question throughout the song would it be enough if I could never give you peace I think in her mind she's saying if I can compensate in all of these other ways is that enough because you're never going to have peace you're never going to be able to have like full privacy anymore if you're with me the rain is always gonna come when you're with me she's still grappling with the fact that is she ever gonna be enough for somebody or are they gonna be able to handle her life Ugh, and then they just like give me this like triple headshot here the archer cornelia street and death by a thousand cuts <laughs> like literally m my three favorite songs from the album. The Archer is like my favorite song from Lover. That one is full of anxiety. In The Bridge, she says, they see right through me, they see right through me. Can you see right through me? And it's kind of like this questioning again, like who could stay? Who could ever leave me, but who could stay? And I think the recurring theme throughout this playlist is the questions and the questions she's asking herself, the questions she's asking other people, her lover. Cornelia Street obviously was the first time we got insight to their relationship that wasn't a hundred percent about just them being in love because on Reputation it was all love songs. It was all good things. It was there wasn't any hints that there was something off and then when I got to Cornelia Street you kind of realized like oh they haven't always been where they are like happy in love all the time which is true of any relationship. You're always going to go through through ups and downs, but 
this was like the first incident where she says like, I packed my bags before you even knew I was gone. And then he called her, she turned around, he was fighting for her. And then she says, I hope I never lose you. I hope this never ends. I'll never walk Cornelia Street again. Again, she's promising herself these things. Like I will never go back to the places we went to together because I couldn't bear the heartbreak of it. This is on the bargaining playlist, Cornelia Street. And she says in her voice note, these are songs I wrote in the bargaining stage, in the bargaining stage and she was still with him for another like three to four years I think oh my god we've got I wish you would say don't go I wish you would is the classic push and pull I wish you would come back and fight for me type of thing like a lot of back and forth and missing each other and then say don't go again she says I will stay forever if you tell me not to leave. I'm telling you, once you d dig into these lyrics, there's a lot here. Better man, you would have been the one if you were a better man. I might still be in love if you were a better man. She's obviously saying like, if you were better, if you loved me more, if you tried harder, I we might have worked out. Renegade, she's ending this one with renegade. Is it insensitive for me to say, get your shit together so I can love you? Are you really gonna talk about timing in times like these and let all your damage damage me. There was, oh my God, literally the, the whole song of Renegade, again, was like, why is she writing this? Like, I thought she was in love. If I would have known how many pieces you had crumbled into, I might have let them lay. She's putting so much effort into, like, making things right. This person just can't get it together. I don't know if she's talking about Joe, obviously. I don't know, like, what the context of this song actually is, but there's definitely, like, making this the last one on here. Okay, let's get into our final. No, actually, we've got two more. Two more. Depression. Love to see it. Taylor added all of my depression songs on this playlist playlist just for me. This is literally my sad girl playlist. <laughs> Okay, so the lyrics of this one are old habits die screaming. So that's a, a play on like a popular quote, old habits die hard. In this one, it's kind of like, I won't go quietly into the night. Hi Apple Music, welcome to my old habits die screaming playlist where we're gonna be exploring the feelings of depression that often lace their way through my songs. In times like these, I'll write a song because I feel lonely or hopeless and writing a song feels like the only way to process that intensity of an emotion and while these things are really really hard to go through usually that's in the phase where i'm close to getting past that feeling so that's interesting because depression is the stage before acceptance and i think she kind of hit the nail on the head there with her writing these songs to get over what it is she's going through i'm also somebody who likes to listen to sad music when i'm sad so i i appreciate the sentiment so the first song on the playlist is bigger than the whole sky which is literally the saddest song on midnights it's about like losing somebody and we again we don't really have context for who she's talking about in the song but it could be your past self it could be a family member it could be a best friend breakup it could be somebody that you were in a relationship with like this song is just dealing with loss and then dear reader is my favorite song on midnights and she talks about going home alone and no one is there and no one sees when you lose when you're playing solitaire which is one of my favorite lines from that song because she's basically like when no one sees you struggling because you're it's like such an internal battle nobody sees it hits so hard and maybe she felt like she couldn't show that feeling of depression and how she has to find another guiding light you're losing me that had to be like peak sadness that is the depression stage in a song. But I also think by the end of the song, it is moving into acceptance because she's saying just like, my heart won't start anymore for you. And I think saying that, it's not saying it won't start anymore at all. It's just saying for you, the specific person. My tears ricochet, epiphany, hoax, hoax obviously huge references to like depression saying stood on the cliff side screaming give me a reason you know to keep going don't want no other shade of blue but you no other sadness in the world would do i think that kind of connects a lot with renegade champagne problems coney island right where you left me it's, again some of the saddest songs on evermore nothing new obviously all too well but it is interesting that she put the five minute version of all too well not the 10 minute for 
forever winter is about a friend experiencing intense depression. Last kiss. You knew this song was gonna be on here. I think this is Taylor Swift's one of her most depressing, sad songs, kind of having to do with relationship. Like obviously she has a lot of sad songs about other things like Ronin and Bigger Than The Whole Sky. Those are more about losing people, soon you'll get better, kind of like those are sad situations. But Last Kiss is just plain sad depression. It's towards the end of the playlist and that song is just about like looking back on the relationship, remembering the good things and that makes it hurt more. So I think that is the stage right before acceptance. You're like feeling the pain of the nostalgia and then kind of have to move on after that. And then we've got White Horse, which is very similar to Last Kiss in my mind. The same kind of feelings, it's just really sad. But at the end of White Horse, there is a shift in the last chorus where she just says, they're in the rear view mirror disappearing now. Like I'm gonna find someone someday who might actually treat me well. Very intentional that's being at the end of that playlist, transitioning us into the acceptance stage. So this is our last stage here. I can do it with a broken heart. Let's hear from Taylor. Hey Apple Music, you've made it to my I can do it with a broken heart playlist where we finally find acceptance and can start moving forward from loss or heartbreak. These songs represent making room for more good in your life, making that choice. Because a lot of time when we lose things, we gain things too. Oh, and then you're on your own, kid. Oh my gosh. A lot of times when we lose things, we gain things too. I love that so much. And I think all of these songs have that theme. You're on your own, kid. It's like sad and it's kind of like a journey, but by the last bridge and the last chorus, you're like on a high. Take the moment and taste it. You have no reason to be afraid. Like chills. Labyrinth, that one is talking about like having like kind of like anxiety, but then like I definitely feel the acceptance in it. It's kind of like hope for a new beginning. You're afraid to fall in love again. You're afraid to get hurt again and go through all those five stages of grief again, but you finally make that decision to like open yourself back up. Of course we have the one, the first line saying, I'm doing good, I'm on some new shit. And I think that is the vibes that Taylor is bringing with this playlist. Invisible string, interesting that that is on this playlist of acceptance. Happiness, very much an acceptance song about accepting a past relationship for what it was and the good that it brought. Saying like, there was happiness because of you, but there will be happiness after you as well. Closure, a synonym for acceptance and everything. I forgot that you existed. Yeah. Daylight, kind of a new beginning. I've been sleeping so long in a 20 year dark night and now I see daylight. This love, I'm just picking out lyrics at this point. This love is alive, back from the dead. Clean, the ultimate acceptance song. Begin again, new beginning, meeting somebody new who treats you well for the first time since your last relationship. Breathe. It is interesting that she has breathe at the end here. I can't breathe without you, but I have to. Literally, I can do it with a broken heart. I feel like I can't breathe without you, but I have to, I have to keep going. So that was a huge deep dive. I didn't like plan on getting that deep into the lyrics of all of these songs, but you know me, like I'm such a lyrics person and I think they can tell us so much about the emotion and connection with all of these themes that Taylor Swift is exploring with the stages of grief. I am curious to see if this album mirrors that a little bit, like which songs are gonna reflect each of these stages of grief. Um, obviously, I think with the names of these playlists and the lyrics that correspond could be an indicator of that. Okay, after a brief intermission for lunch, I'm back to finish this video. So a couple of days ago, Taylor Swift posted a little typewriter video of some lyrics from one of the songs. Two days ago was the solar eclipse, which is when the moon goes in front of the sun. I think she posted this lyric obviously because it had the word eclipse in it. So I don't know if she was planning on doing that, but then she saw that there was an eclipse and she was like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if I posted this lyric that had the word eclipse in it. So the lyric was, crowd goes wild at her fingertips, half moon shine, full eclipse. 
Some people were saying that could be from a few songs. My first thought was I can do it with a broken heart because when I hear the title of that song, it makes me think she did the entire era's tour while going through this breakup or at least dealing with the aftermath of it. She could have broken up with him earlier on before the era's tour. Obviously she probably did, but like dealing with ending a six year relationship is not a quick thing. And so I think especially because because she was singing songs on the Eras tour that she had written about them and their love, that it was like really hard for her. And so when I hear the word, the crowd goes wild, you immediately think the Eras tour. And when I think about the Eras tour, I think about how she had to keep going and perform all of these songs while doing it, going through heartbreak. So that was my first thought. And then some other people were saying, well, it's in the third person. She says her, not me. She's not talking in the first person, so it could be about Clara Bow, who is the starlet that she wrote the last track on the album. I think it's the last track on the album, who was the it girl of... I think it was either the 1920s, 1930s, everyone at her fingertips. So it could be about that. And upon more digging into like the symbolism of a total eclipse, a lot of people think that it marks a new beginning. So those are just some little predictions and theories there that have to do with those lyrics that she posted. And then last thing from the rumor mill is that something got posted a few days ago saying the tortured poets department has sonic similarities to red and reputation. Songs fluctuated from big pop loud chorus to 2000s soft rock ballads similar to Holy Ground and All Too Well. So I think a lot of people got excited by that. I would take that with a grain of salt, obviously, because it just says, according to an insider, we have no idea if it's true or not. But that's interesting because I've heard this album being compared like, oh, it's gonna have the lyrics of Folklore and Evermore, but the sound of Midnight's or the hyper pop sound of 1989 Midnight's, like her classic pop sound. To hear that it could be more similar to Red and Reputation is interesting because that's not something I necessarily thought about. It didn't come to mind at first. So we will see what this album sounds like. I have seen the theory that So Long London is around nine minutes long. Apparently it got posted on iTunes, the length of all the tracks, the timestamps. I, again, all of this, we don't know 100% confirmed until the album comes out actually and we listen to the songs. Okay guys, so I'm just popping in here because the track lengths was posted on Spotify yesterday. And so now we know how long each song is. So Long London is not nine minutes long. All Too Well is not gonna have a sister. It's actually four minutes and 22 seconds long. So squashed that rumor. But this album has some long songs on it. The entirety of this album is the same length as Red. And Red is a really long album. So so 65 minutes, 16 songs. So that's not including the four bonus songs, which we don't know how long those are yet. How are we going to listen to the bonus songs on the day of? Like, where are we going to find them? Are we going to have to wait to go get the physical copy of it? It's kind of stressing me out. There are a few songs that are really long. First one is, I think this is the longest song on the album, but Daddy I Love Him is five minutes and 40 seconds. I was expecting expecting this song to be more of like a pop song and that long of a song is usually not the like synth pop vibe because like if you think about 1989, Midnight, all the songs on those albums are pretty short in comparison. If you look at songs on Speak Now, Red, there are much longer songs on those albums and those songs are not entirely like the pop songs. You know, we have Dear John that's super long. So it could just be one of these power ballads, which is kind of crazy because I expected that one to be much more like glitter gel pen. And then the other one that's super long is Who's Afraid of Little Old Me? And that one is five minutes and 34 seconds. These are like 
all too well original version length. These are long songs. It's literally insane. And then the title track, The Tortured Poets Department, is four minutes and 53 seconds. So that one's another almost five minute song. And there's a ton of four minute songs. And then we have the song, I Can Fix Him, No Really I Can, is the shortest song on the album and it's two minutes and 36 seconds. I just have a feeling this album is gonna just be all over the place. And also a ton of these have the explicit symbol on it. So Tortured Poets Department, Down Bad, but daddy I love him Florida LOML I can do it with a broken heart in smallest man who ever lived so that is quite a bit of songs on the album I would say that's like almost half of the album is explicit and I'm shocked that so long London doesn't have a curse word in it I feel like that song if any of them would have a curse word oh my gosh anyways I just wanted to pop in here and talk about this because some people might not think that track length matters that much but it kind of can tell you quite a bit about a song because you're not gonna have like a glitter gel pen pop song that's five minutes long. Some of these I just have a feeling are gonna be like really hard hitting power ballads. So mark my words. I'm so excited. Okay back to the video. I just like can't believe we're gonna be listening to these songs so soon. It's just the weirdest feeling knowing Taylor Swift songs exist that I haven't heard. I just know they're gonna change my life. <laughs> One of these songs is gonna be the most streamed song of the year for me on Spotify Wrapped. It's gonna be my top album. It's gonna be the sound of my summer. My 2024 is gonna revolve around this album. And it's crazy because I haven't even heard it yet. I don't really have any last predictions, truly. This is one of those albums that and I'm just gonna let it happen. I have really no thoughts about it because every time I try to theorize, I'm wrong. Or, I mean, sometimes I'm right though. Or maybe sometimes we just put these theories out into the universe and Taylor likes to like play jokes on us and make them seem like they were intentional when they were just a coincidence. But to end out this video, I am going to guess what my favorite song is going to be on this album. And it's funny because every time I do this, it's incorrect because I thought anti-hero or mastermind was gonna be my favorite song but actually like midnight rain maroon those were more so my favorite songs from the initial track list and then obviously we didn't even know the 3 a.m tracks and the 3 a.m tracks were like you know half of them are in my top five songs of midnights so i'm gonna take a chance and say i'm claiming track 13 i can do it with a broken heart i just have a good feeling about it oh and then also the title title track, The Tortured Poets Department. Those are the two songs I think that will be my favorite, so stay tuned for my full reaction to see if I'm correct. Um, I will be having all of my reoccurring characters in my videos coming for the release party and I'm so excited. Everyone from the Eras crew is coming to listen to the album with me and I'm so excited to see like everyone's reactions and just listen to it all together. I'm gonna have a little party. It's gonna be so cute. I'm gonna be working on getting decorations and different aesthetic ideas, which I will be filming my get ready with me for my listening party. So leave your last minute tortured poets predictions down below. I would love to read through them. I love seeing the theories and people are always DMing me like, I think this is like a theory here. And like people are always sending me stuff on Instagram and whatever. And I don't, I love to see it all. But yeah, thank you guys so much for being here and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.